Thank you, Sophina. Good morning. It's great to be uh, here with you. Normally, I am holding a guitar. For those of you who are new here visiting um, or are not used to seeing me without holding uh, this instrument, um, I do oversee the, the, uh, the worship here. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here. And it is great to uh, be able to be speaking uh, to you or sharing with you um, today. I don't know about you, but I like underdog stories. Does anyone hear? I think there's something in the human heart which just loves to cheer on the underdog. Are you, you, you that kind of person? You know, the, the kind of movies that kind of against all odds, you know, kind of the trailer goes. Um, Particularly in sport, I think we've seen this uh, recently with the Olympics. Loads of you know amazing stories of against all the odds, uh, athletes have have won the day. As an Australian, you know I'm getting used to being the underdog, which grieves me to say because I've always grown up um, hearing the the Brits whinge that they're the underdogs. But I think now we're going to have to uh, appeal to that status of underdogs. And I think even with the uh, the Paralympics. Um, there are amazing stories, aren't there, of, of how, uh, against the odds, um, the human will has, has fought um, against disabilities and, and challenges in life. And I was watching last night um, a, a woman called Hazel Robert, Robson, is her name, Hazel Robson, and she's, I think, in the T36 class. She's a Brit. Uh, there's her photo there. And... Um, she was in the final last night of the 200 metres, and she was born with cerebral palsy. And at birth, the doctor said to her parents, she will never walk. She'll never walk. And in Sydney, I think, was her first Olympics, where she ran and won the gold medal. And it's amazing, isn't it? And you, you, your heart and your spirit is lifted when you see and read of these stories, and you, you just want to go, yes, you want to cheer them on. I don't know about where you're at this morning. Are there challenges in your life um, where you feel a little bit like you're the underdog, where you're, you've got something going on and you, you're not quite sure how you're going to, to win, how you're going to see resolution, how you're going to see success? And I think what we see here in uh, this passage in Joshua is is the Israelites are confronted as the underdogs. It's two against five. Five nations have rallied together and have attacked uh, Israel's, uh, I guess, counterpart in treaty, Gibeon. And they are challenged. They are the underdog. And what we, I want to look at this morning is Joshua's response. Josh, Joshua's response. I'm going to quickly catch you up with the story because it's going to be important later on. Firstly, we read of in chapter 7 and 8, the attack of Israel onto this small uh, nation, city, province called Ai. And they lose. I mean, Joshua didn't even send his whole army. He kind of sent a bunch of his best men and said, that'll be fine. Yet they get an absolute butt-kicking. I can say that. 36, men of, uh, 36 of their soldiers die and they get run away in shame and embarrassment. The story continues and develops because what emerges is that one of the civilians of Israel, a man called Achan, had taken some of the loot from Jericho. Loot that was gold, silver, riches, treasures that was to be dedicated to the temple's treasury, he took for himself and he, he buried it in his tent. The story goes that he is found out. And the result being that he and his entire family are executed. Pretty extreme. That is the result of the people of Israel going against the word and the covenant of God. Anyway, the Israelites then take Ai again with great force. Joshua marshals his troops again and they, they wipe out Ai. Word gets around. The nation's now hearing this, this large nation of Israel is on the move. So one little province 
called Gibeon. Kind of, they, they, they're crafty, you see. And they, they dress up in old clothes and act like they've been journeying a long way. Moldy, I don't know how they did it, but they had moldy bread and kind of like they, they purposely, and they hand it all up. It was proper acting. And they went to the people of Israel and said, well, listen, we have come from a long, long way away. And we've heard of all the amazing things that, you've, that God has been doing in and through you. And we want to make a treaty with you. We want to make peace with you. So the Israelites foolishly, they're again commanded by God not to make treaty. They make treaty with Gibeon. And then after they've made treaty, they find out that actually Gibeon, Gibeon is a neighbor. It's a neighboring province, a neighboring city. And so they're caught in this relationship. And because of this treaty, now a whole bunch of other nations go, oh my goodness, Gibeon has made a treaty with Israel. And so we pick up the story here that the king of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, marshals a whole bunch of other neighboring cities. The neighbors are angry. They're not happy. And they see to it that, well, they seek to see to it that this treaty will not stand for long. And so they intend on attacking and destroying Gibeon. And Israel are drawn into it because Gibeon go, help, as we read. We're about to be attacked. I don't know if they said it in that voice, but they could have. I think you would have if you're scared. And then Israel, because of the treaty, have to go and help their counterparts, their lower counterparts, their vassals, to use a technical word. And so Israel are caught in this underdog scenario. Five surrounding nations against Israel and Gibeon. Now, I've, I've never been in real battle or, or warfare. I assume that most, if not all of you, haven't. And so I don't want to kind of immediately go, right, then we exactly know what that's feels like to be in that situation. But I do want to kind of work it at this whole thing of what does, what does this passage mean for us? What does it mean for us sitting here today, 2012? What are the, what are the challenges that, that we face? What are the challenges that, that you face today? What are the things that you're struggling with. Maybe it's financial pressure. Maybe it's work pressure. Maybe there's tension in relationships. Maybe there are are difficulties within your home that you're not quite sure how you're going to find reconciliation and, and resolution. Are there disappointments that you carry, missed expectations, dreams that you have, which are no longer or are not possibly realized are you exhausted are you depressed are you tired of life are you at the point of going i'm ready to give up or maybe you you're feeling like you know what i'm just not seeing enough of god in my life there's something more out there and i just am not seeing it are there things, are there mountains in your life? Are there challenges which you are confronting? I'm sure there are where you feel like you're the underdog. Well, I want to turn to Joshua's response very briefly this morning and, and look at two things, or two or three things that he did as a response to this situation. Five against two. And the first we see as we observe, as we go through this passage, is that Joshua engages in radical prayer. Radical prayer. And he prays some amazing prayers. We'll get to it in a minute, but it's like, wow. As I've been kind of pondering and considering this passage this week, I've been challenged myself, saying, God, where are the challenges in my life? Where are the things that, where is, where is my prayer life at? Am I praying big prayers? 
Am I crying out to you in desperation? Am I living like I need you? Or am I self-sufficient? Am I not needing to pray those big prayers for God to intervene, for God to work? I don't know about you. That, I mean, it's a real challenge for me, a real challenge this week. And as we look at Joshua here, we see firstly that he doesn't say anything. It, there is an active listening part. Well, this, verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. It's not that Joshua goes to God. It's, it's that, that Joshua in, in space hears the voice of God. I don't know about you, but if, if I'm challenged with a certain situation, something's going wrong, um, I'm, I've got a big project to do, I've been trying to write my master's thesis over the last month, and there have been many times where I've cried out to God in the midst of terrible words, going, Lord, save me, save this paper. Do something with it. You know, we, we tend to kind of list off all our our problems and our issues before God. And what's interesting here is that the first communication that we see in this passage is Joshua hears the voice of God. And what I love about this is that Joshua says, uh, what Joshua hears are familiar words. I have given them into your hand. Does that sound familiar? They were words that were spoken to Joshua before Jericho. They were words that were spoken to Joshua before the second attempt on Ai. And I think what, God, what we can learn here is that God knows how we hear him. And, he, and, and as he did with Joshua, he gives words that we can trust, words that we've heard before, words that we know. Think back to times where you've heard the voice of God, where you've been in a place where God has revealed himself to you or spoken to you. Often it will be in a similar way, God will continue to speak to you. Sometimes it will be different. But I love the generosity of God here of just repeating and saying, hey, you've heard my voice before. I'm going to say the same thing again to you. I'm just going to remind you. You can trust this word because you've heard it before. I think one of the challenges in terms of, of prayer is, is listening. I, I know it's a challenge for me because I, I do like to talk. Maybe my argument is I'm a verbal processor. Oh, God, I'm a verbal processor. You know, I just need to get it out. I don't know if you're a verbal processor. Megan is very patient with me. Often at the time I have to, oh, I wish I didn't say that. <laughs> listening is not easy at times, particularly when you're under pressure. And there are many things that get in the way. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian philosopher, said, a man prayed, and at first he thought that prayer was talking, but he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer is listening. I find that really challenging. And I know that it's been something that I've been working on. I try to, when I spend time with the Lord each morning, before I even start praying, I just say, God, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to say to me? Remind me of who you are. Remind me of what you say about me. Remind me of the truth of the gospel. And that's a great thing to hear first thing in the morning. And God, what are you wanting me to do today? What are you saying to me today? What are the areas in my life that I need to address, redress? It's hard though, and I find myself in the mornings sitting down and then beginning to list off all the issues of the day. The enemy of busyness, of tasks, of deadlines. I think even more profoundly, the problem of self-reliance. 
John Piper says, for most of us, the voice of self-reliance is 10 times louder than the bell that tolls for the hours of prayer. Nothing exalts him more than the collapse of self-reliance, which issues a passionate cry for help. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And we see this with Joshua here. He, it, it, he's realized, actually, you know, we cannot be self-reliant. He learned that from AI. He learned that looking back when, when they failed, when they thought, you know what, we're going to be okay. We'll, just, we'll send the best, we'll send a few, we'll be fine. And God reminded him in a, in a, in a drastic way, you know what, you cannot be self-reliant. Everything you do is reliant on my grace and my goodness and my provision. The battles, our battles, Joshua's battle, is fundamentally and ultimately won on knees. We win our battles on our knees. I'm going to cry out to God. Say, God, we need you. We need you. We need you. And as a church, we want to do that as well. As you would have seen on SPS News, Thursday night, we want to gather together and say, God, we need you. As a church, we need you. I mean, we can continue to go on doing all the wonderful programs that we do as a church, keep pumping out the, the wonderful things that we do, but unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit, unless we know the presence and power of Jesus Christ in this church, then we are just doing things on our own strength. We are operating in self-reliance, and we will not see the true power and victory of God. And we want to see that. We want to see that in this community. We want to see that in this area of London, in East London. We want to see the power and love, the transforming work of Jesus Christ in our area. Do you want to see that in, in this area? Do you want to see it in your life? Well, it happens by firstly and foremostly crying out to God and saying, God, I need you. We need you. So come Thursday night. We get to cry out and say, God, we need you. We need you. And then we see in Joshua, once he had heard from the Lord, once he had recognized that I hear, and I need to hear from God here, then he moves into boldly asking. And he asked the most profound, well, the thing, the thing about this is in verse, and we're now skipping forward to verse 12. The thing about this is it's not really a prayer. Knowing what God has commissioned him to do, hearing from the word of God, he then can say, son, stand still. It's not even, God, it would be really great if you could just, just hold the sun up there for a moment and, and the moon where that is, wherever that is, just hold it there for a moment. It's almost like he says to the Lord in speaking to something, he says, I command the sun and the moon to stand still. And we see that the sun for a whole day stays in the middle of the sky. There is a bit of discussion about whether it was the moon actually up and the, the sun because they were marching overnight. I think that verse um, 14 says it pretty plainly. It says, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down for a full day. Stayed up in the sky, 24 hours. That's an amazing miracle. I also think it's a crazy prayer. Because, I mean, think about it. Can you think about daylight saving, just for a moment? <laughs> March, you realize on the Saturday night that you lose one hour of sleep. And, and, and I, I don't know if I would say, Lord, just make the moon stand still. Just an hour, maybe two. 24 hours he wanted the sun to be up there. That's, you know, no nap time, no sleep time. 24 hours the sun is up. An amazing, maybe slightly crazy prayer. How in the world can he pray this prayer? How can he pray this prayer? Well, fundamentally, the reason he can pray such an audacious prayer is because of faith. It's faith. And it's not blind faith. It's not a ridiculous faith that says, you know what, well, actually be really handy here for our prayers that, you know, kind of say, I'd really like that Ferrari or, you know, that new house or whatever. 
He is engaged in the activity of God that God has called him to, to, the command of God. He knows that he's in the center of God's will for this time. And he's also seen the provision of God in his life through Jericho, through the crossing of the Jordan. It's not a blind faith. It's not a stupid faith. It's a recognition that he is doing God's will and that God is faithful and God is good and God provides. And I think it's something that they have to work on, to be honest, and it's something that we have to work on. It's really interesting that after their failure at AI, if you want to flip back just a chapter or two, He renews the covenant with God and he reminds all of the people there, all the Israelites and all the people that had picked up on the way of the covenant that they had with Israel. And I think my point is, is that we need to look back and see what God has promised us. We need to look back to the covenant that he has made with us. We need to remind ourselves time and time again of his faithfulness and his goodness because we forget. Israel continued to forget. We are like Israel. We continue to forget. And the circumstances surround us, we continue to forget. And so remember the times where God has been faithful to you. Remember the times where God has been faithful in difficult circumstances. Fundamentally, remember the covenant that God has made to us in Jesus Christ. We'll come to that in a minute. And as a reminder here for parents as well, tell your children, remind your children, tell them of the covenant. Tell them of what Jesus has done. Tragically, we continue to read in Joshua and Judges that they failed to do that. They forgot, failed to tell generation to the next generation of all that God had done. We can pray prayers of faith because we have seen God work in our past. And fundamentally, we have seen his faithfulness in Jesus Christ. We will come to that in a minute. If we see then that there is radical prayer by Joshua, then we also see that there is secondly obedient action. It's not just prayer, thank you God, do it, see you later, we'll just watch you do it now, thank you very much. There is an obedience, there is an action that takes place. They march 20 miles, they march 20 miles overnight, we don't know, that it doesn't say 20 miles there, but the, the people who know, people who've uh, done the research it's about 20 mile walk. Now that's a long way. I've run a marathon 26 miles. Um, I was, probably didn't have what they were wearing on. Um, but it's a long way. Particularly then if the sun's gonna stay up for 24 hours and you're fighting a battle. What they do is extraordinary, superhuman to use the word of the day. They are active they back up their prayer, their request with action. The question for us is, do we expect God just to do it for us? You know, do we just pray those prayers, oh God, I wish this circumstance would change, thank you very much, without actually taking steps along the journey? I wish this wasn't in my life. I wish that this addiction was gone. I wish that I wasn't sitting in this way. I wish that my financial problems were, were sorted out. Thank you very much, God. But then not do anything about it. We see here that Joshua then acts. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, I'm not quite sure what to do. What do I do? I remember um, when I was at, at, uh, studying theology at Bible College several years ago, I... Um, a, a, a godly man called Stuart Briscoe from America, originally from, uh, from the UK, was speaking and he, he gave some time to students afterwards and I was in a real point of going, God, I, I really don't know what to do with my life. 
I'm really trying, I was really wrestling with it. It was, a, it, was a, it was a mountain in my life. I just didn't know. And I sat down and asked him, I said, well, how do you know the voice of God? What do I do if I'm not sure? And he just turned to me and said, Andrew, just do something. There's, there's lots of things that you can be doing. Open the Bible. Look at the commands of Jesus. There is lots that you can be doing. There is lots that we can be doing. And so for us, it might be whatever it is, it's confronting fear, it's stepping up, it's standing up, it's telling a friend, it's getting in a connect group, it's getting in a small group, it's registering in a course. Whatever it is, it's, it's getting involved and playing a part, backing up your prayer with your action. But it's not about striving and this is what is really interesting about this passage. It's, it's not just about our action. God intervenes. There is divine action here in the most profound way. It's a little bit like, you know, like a little boy kind of come, come on, you know, with someone's attacking, you know, another boy's attacking him, and the boy starts running away, freaking out. And the boy, yeah, hey, I got him. He didn't know behind him that his dad was standing there, you know, kind of like Israel coming, come on, we'll take you. But behind them is God, kind of. He's doing all the work. And so we read in verse 10, and I think it, it's, there's a slight mistranslation here. Verse 10 says, The Lord threw them into, into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. Actually, it could be translated that ac- the active words that are given to Israel could be given to God. So we could read it that God threw them into confusion, that God defeated them at Gibeon, that God pursued them down the road and cut them all the way to Akezda, Azekah, sorry. Sophina got it right. Azekah. Um, It was God. It was God who did it. And so then we read that, you know, I love this part. The last, in verse 14, the greatest understatement of all time. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. It's like, no kidding. He he was like throwing down rocks from heaven or hail. I think here, I I do find there, there are some questions that are raised for me about you know, it's, it's not really nice language. I don't know about you. As you read these, these verses, and I've, I, I wrestle with this. How can a loving God do this? This seems quite devastating, quite cruel. The words are difficult to read, and I think they should be. I think we need to grapple with this. I think we need to struggle with this a bit. Darren suggested a book a few weeks ago uh, called Show Them No Mercy, um, Four Views on the Canaanite Genocide, and I can also recommend that to you. Just It's four different views, different takes on how you can understand this passage. So if you do have questions and you want to engage with it, then check it out, Show Them No Mercy. It's on, on Amazon. But I want to give just two really quick um, ideas or thoughts that have been helpful for me as as I've been working through this passage before we come in to conclude. Firstly, I want to say, say, and as I see it, I see that, that God is on God's side. God is on God's side. I think it's very easy to read this and see, understandably, that God is just on Israel's side. But that's not the case. God fights for holiness And God fights for justice and righteousness. I think we, and I don't know if Rich touched on this last week, I wasn't here, but Joshua 5, when the servant of the Lord comes to Joshua before they um, move into Jericho, Joshua asks the servant of the Lord, he says, are you for us or our enemies? And the answer is neither, is neither. I think we see this worked out in the sin of, of Achan, where Achan goes against the, the, the covenant requests of God. 
that is within the context of Israel. And he is punished accordingly. And we see throughout the story of Israel, yes, God makes covenant with Israel. But he makes covenant with Israel based on curses and blessings, blessings and curses. If you do this, I will bless you. But if you do this, you will be under the subject of judgment. And so we see that within the the, the continuing story of Israel. That God is not just by he's not just partisan to Israel. God is consumed fundamentally about righteousness and about holiness. But we also see in the Old Testament, time and time again, the phrase, God is patient, he is slow to anger, he is abounding in love. If we just take this snapshot and we see this part of God, we would, I think, honestly think, man, God is just angry and wrathful. But that would be only half the story because then we come to Jesus Christ, where God doesn't kill people, God dies himself. God is killed. few weeks ago, Rod, actually the first week, when introducing Joshua, spoke of the fact that the Old Testament must be read through the lens of Jesus Christ. In fact, that Joshua means the Lord saves. It's a, it's a kind of a, a name and a word which points to the name Jesus. And so we must read this in the light of the activity and the work of Jesus Christ is that Jesus has taken on, when he went to the cross and when he died, he took on the punishment. God himself died. And so then, in Christ, if God is on God's side, in Christ, we are on God's side. We are on God's side. And Jesus wins at the cross. Not only does Jesus die, but he rises again. And we see these pictures prophetically. In Psalm 24, we read, Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And we read in Revelation that one day Jesus will come back as victorious. Jesus wins. And profoundly, we are invited into a relationship with God through what Jesus has done for us. And I don't know about you today, I don't know if you can say, I am in Christ. Maybe some of you today have have not stepped across the threshold and said, "I, I recognize that I need Jesus that I am broken, that I'm an enemy of God because of what I do, because of what I have done. And it's at the cross that Jesus saves us. He takes the, the, the punishment and the penalty for us. But it still feels like a battle, and, and, and I don't know, again, where you're at this morning There is a continual battle that we face as we walk with Christ. I love Romans chapter 8. After Paul says, you know what, life is a struggle. Life is a struggle. I do what I don't want to do. I struggle with sin. I struggle with, with the battles of life. He then concludes in the first verse of Romans chapter 8 by saying, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The ultimate divine action, the ultimate divine action is Jesus Christ coming to die for us and rising again so that we may be reconciled with God. That is the ultimate divine action. 
And so what, as we come to, as we conclude, what, what can we take from this quite graphic story? We've touched on perhaps what may be some of the challenges, the enemies, the mountains in your life. Maybe even now, just think of them. What are they? And as you look at them, think of the response that we see in Joshua. Creating time to sit and listen to the voice of God in prayer. And in that place, recalling the goodness of God, recalling what he has done for us, recalling what he has done for us at the cross, the ultimate divine action. Begin to thank him and ask him, God, will you do this in my life? Praying the prayer in the center of his will for you praying those big, audacious, godly prayers. And then stepping up and taking action and doing something about it, calling somebody, registering in a course, getting involved in a connect group, getting in a small group, walking with somebody. That's what we see in Joshua and that I think is the encouragement for us this morning as we seek to live out our lives, not always easily, but always in Christ, knowing that he is for us and fighting for us. Shall we pray?